I'm Vanessa, the associate editor at Book Riot, here with another new release Tuesday video. First is The Other People by C.J. Tudor. In this mystery thriller, we meet Gabe, who is driving home one night when he looks up and sees that out of the rearview window of the car in front of him is a little girl who is mouthing the word daddy. Problem, that little girl is his five-year-old daughter, Izzy, and that is the last time he ever sees her again. Three years later, Gabe is a shell of a man driving up and down the highway, desperately searching for Izzy, who he believes to be alive, though she is by most presumed dead. Then one day, that car turns up abandoned at the side of the road and is found with a body inside it, and Gabe must now confront the truth of what probably happened to Izzy and a lot of other painful events from his past as they come to the surface. Meanwhile, Fran and her daughter Alice are running, and they are running because they know the truth of what happened to Izzy that fateful night. Those responsible will definitely see that harm comes to them if they tell the truth, so they have to keep one step ahead and hope that they don't catch up with them. This is the type of thriller that both really excites me and also makes me an absolute nervous wreck as I'm sure will be the case for many of you especially if you have you know children or small kids in your life if you are familiar at all with the work of CJ Tudor you know that you're in good hands she's written other stuff like the chalk man and the hiding place which are all very well beloved so if you're a fan of a good thriller or a fan of CJ Tudor then add this one to your pile Next is High Five by Joe Ide. IQ is back and he is investigating the murder of a man who was found dead in a Newport Beach boutique. That man's girlfriend is the owner of the boutique named Christiana and Christiana happens to be the daughter of the biggest arms dealer on the West Coast. IQ is essentially strong-handed into taking Christiana's case to help prove her innocence. She is the only person who witnessed the crime and, you know, he's trying to get her name cleared. That arms dealer, Angus, essentially tells IQ that if he cannot prove Christiana's innocence, then he will see to it that IQ's new girlfriend is harmed. As if all of that weren't enough pressure, this case is particularly complicated by the fact that Christiana has multiple personalities. There are five distinct, very different personalities from one another. In one, she's a wanton seductress. In another, she's a beautiful shopkeeper. In another, she's the leader of a rock band. And no one of these personalities witnessed the crime. Several of them did, I think all, in fact. So IQ has to piece together the clues of what happened by essentially drawing the truth out of each of these five personalities. I probably don't have to tell you too much about Joe Ide. He is a fan favorite in this detective fiction mystery genre. For those of you that don't know, the IQ series all feature this particular detective, IQ, whose uh, full name is Isaiah Kintabe. He is a black detective and a unlicensed private detective <laughs> in the East Long Beach area in LA, where all of these books are at least partially set. From what I understand, because I have not read this series in spite of meaning to, you do need to read these in order, but the good news is this is the fourth in the series you have plenty to keep busy with. Next is Gay Like Me, A Father Writes to His Son by Richie Jackson. This is an urgent love letter from Richie Jackson, who is an award-winning Broadway film and TV producer to his young son. The letter is a reflection and examination of the fact that Richie's son does, in theory, live in a more liberated America with respect to LGBTQ rights. It's a reflection on what it will be like for Richie's son to live in what appears to be a more liberated America, definitely got dives into the history of how far LGBTQ rights have come since the days of Stonewall. It comments on the increase in visibility of gay people, of the legalization of the right to marry, of the availability of drugs to treat HIV. It's also a reckoning of the fact that bigotry appears to once again be on the rise in this country, and that homophobia in a whole new wave seems to have reached kind of a new high under this administration. It's a celebration of gay identity and parenting and of the urging of the gay community and his son to take joy and pride in who they are, but to never remain complacent. As I was reading the synopsis for this book, I immediately thought back to Between the World and Me by ta Coates. And of course, once I read a little bit more on the publisher's description, I saw that this is exactly what the book is comped to. It has that same feel of, you know, an urgent letter to one's offspring, hopefully educating them a little bit about the world that they are navigating, and, you know, the difficulties, the, the beautiful bright spots, the like awful lows, the discrimination that you'll face. 
by being any member of a marginalized community, this, you know, specifically in this instance as a gay man. It is a short memoir, but one that promises to pack a pretty hard punch. Next is Don't Read the Comments by Eric Smith. Divya Sharma is a queen, at least she is when she's playing Reclaim the Sun, a popular online game where she is known as D1V. She's wildly popular, she's really great at the game, but in real life she's actually parlaying her newfound popularity into sponsorships because she's trying really hard to help her single mom pay the bills. Then we meet Aaron Jericho, whose entire life is also this Reclaim the Sun game, much to the chagrin of his mother who wishes that he had been a doctor like her. He dives into Reclaim the Sun for a little bit of escapism, as so many others do, and against all odds, finds himself on the same remote planet as a celebrity gamer, D1B. At home, Divya and Aaron have plenty of problems to deal with and manage, but within the you know construct of this game, Reclaim the Sun, they have each other, which is particularly important because a lot of trolls are beginning to inhabit the world of this online game. Things take a dark turn when some of those trolls form an organization called Vox Populi that initiates real life doxing campaigns against Aaron and Divya. The trolls think that they can kick Divya out of the game, but they have another thing coming because she won't go out without a fight. Full disclosure, Eric Smith may be a name that sounds familiar to you, and that is because Eric Smith is the co-host of Book Riot's Hey YA podcast, along with Kelly Jensen. I was reading the premise for this book and thought, oh, this sounds so interesting. And then, wait, Eric, Eric, like, Eric Smith, <laughs> I totally forgot that he had a book coming out. He is an YA editor, and this time we get to read his work out in the world. Next is A Delicate Deception, a romance by Kat Sebastian. Amelia Allenby is a reclusive historical novelist I'm sold already, <laughs> who after a string of very stressful events that just cause her anxiety to go through the roof, decides that she needs to retire from London society for a bit and find a little bit of respite in Derbyshire out in the countryside. She's looking forward to some solitude and you know quiet long walks when she meets a purveyor of land, an engineer actually, this like tall burly gentleman who she admits is maybe a little bit attractive. And though she's at first a tad annoyed at not, you know, getting the solitude that she was looking forward to, soon finds herself, you know, falling for this, you know, buff bow. That engineer's name is Sidney, and he finds himself in the same place as Amelia because he's recently inherited a large property called Pelham Hall. This inheritance is a very reluctant one because it's unfortunately one that he came into when tragedy struck his family, specifically his brother and sister-in-law. He is at this estate awaiting the arrival of his friend, the Duke of Hereford, and in you know that waiting process meets Amelia and before he knows it finds himself you know sharing lemon tea cakes and some pretty hot and heavy kisses. But when that Duke arrives, the jig is up and the truth of some deceptions on Sydney's parts are revealed and both Amelia and Sydney will have to decide if you know a lifetime of hurt is going to keep them apart or if they can find a way to stay together. This book is the latest in Kat Sebastian's Regency Imposter series, which if you don't know are a really cool series of books that are all either queer or queer adjacent. Uh, they are, I believe, all male female and they're all Regency romances. So yeah, if you are looking for a little bit of queer romance, definitely look into the rest of this series. And last is High Fire by Owen Colfer. This fantasy sounds like a trip. It is definitely a mix of comedy and fantasy. So the main character here is Wyvern, who is a dragon, who in the days of yore used to, you know, roam the skies, scorching angry mobs. But these days, he finds himself, more often than not, in a lazy boy recliner where he wears his favorite flash dance t-shirt and drowns his sorrows in vodka. On the one hand, he's survived. He is literally the last of his kind, so that's great. But he longs for the days when, you know, his mere presence struck fear in the hearts of men. Then we meet a guy named Squib, who is out here trying to stay afloat. He has recently undertaken a job working for a pretty, you know, shady figure doing shady things when one night he witnesses his employer being killed by a corrupt cop. That cop's name is Regent's Hooks, and he is a terrible, terrible person who, in addition to being a corrupt cop, also has an eye out in a pretty vile and disgusting way for Squibb's mother. When he realizes that Squibb has witnessed the murder of, you know, Squibb's former employer, he goes to essentially wipe him out with a grenade launcher when in comes Wyvern, who now goes by Vern, 
to save Squib from impending doom. So now Squib knows Wyvern's secret and Wyvern needs that to stay a secret. So they strike up an interesting partnership where Squib essentially agrees to be Vern's familiar. He fetches him vodka, keeps him company ex in exchange for protection from Hook, that dirty cop. Hook, Vern, and Squib are all slowly careening towards each other in what promises to be a fiery reckoning in which dragons will either become officially extinct forever or Vern will return to his days of glory. I admit I've never read Owen Colfer, who I know is the best-selling author of the Artemis Fowl series, but this just sounds so amazing and hilarious, the idea of this, you know, dragon hanging out in Netflix and chilling by his very lonesome in his flash dance t-shirt, just thinking about the days when he used to get to set stuff on fire. <laughs> Plus this, you know, interesting layer of like the corrupt cop and the guy who needs saving. It, it sounds like something that would be really fun to dive into. That's all I've got for you this week. Join me again next time for another new release Tuesday and happy reading in the meantime.